one of the great Christian teachers of the second century named Irenaeus uh, has a famous line in his, in his book called Against the Heresies. Good title for a book, isn't it? Uh, we could all afford to read or write a book like that, Against Heresies. Uh, he has a line where he says, the, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. That vision of God's glory, I think, is at the heart of the Christian, is that, is that better? Of the Christian hero that I want to introduce you to tonight, William Blake. Uh, some of you might know a bit about Blake already. I'm just moving that further away from my mouth. Um, uh, a great artist, engraver, illustrator, and poet from the uh, 18th century. Um, Blake had a sort of uneventful and uh, not particularly successful life. He was brought up in a working class family. He went to not like a highbrow art school, but the type of art school just to teach you how to be a commercial artist. Um, are, we are we still on? How's that? Okay. Um, anyway, and he spent his life trying to eke out a living making uh, beautiful engravings and illustrated books. And he, he dreamed of one day... Um, is that okay now? Yeah. All right. Uh, he dreamed of one day making money from his own books, because he was a, 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 a poet. Um, some of his books, which today are regarded among the great works of the English language, some of them he's known to have sold at least four copies. <laughs> uh, they were not a great success. So if you're a poet, take heart. You know, it's always been, it's always been hard for poets. Um, Blake was one of the things that, um, that uh, made his life difficult is he was accused a number of times of being crazy. There were stories that circulated about him. Here's, here's one uh, example of a story that circulated about Blake. Uh, one of his friends went to his house one day. You've got to imagine 18th century England, right? People were pretty buttoned up. Uh, London, uh, someone went to his house one day and there was Mr. Blake and his wife uh, in the backyard, in, in the nude, reading the story of Adam and Eve together. Um, <laughs> when another friend of Blake's was asked one time, is he cracked in the head? He replied, yes but it's a crack that lets the light in. If Blake was, uh, personally, I don't think he was crazy or, or, or anything like that, uh, but he, he was certainly unconventional and he had no interest at all in matching up to some kind of set of prefabricated social conventions. In fact, he was a severe critic of the whole idea of matching your life according to social conventions. And this is where Blake, a lot of Blake's most potent criticisms of the Christian religion were focused. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but some of the great characters in religious history, nearly every single one of them actually, are people who are flat out opposed to their own religion. The prophets rail against Israel's sacrifice and feast days and pronounce God's hatred and judgment upon the very system of worship that God gave Israel. Jesus uh, is furious with the temple and with the system of religious observance uh, and is clearly seen as a threat to the existing religious order. His own religion, right? He's not, he's not like being insensitive towards someone else's religion. It's his own one that he finds so unsatisfactory. Martin Luther, who I introduced you to a couple of, or didn't introduce you to, but talked to you about a couple of weeks ago, um, he, he uh, condemned the entire Christian church of his day as the Antichrist. Not as a community that helps to put you in touch with Christ, 
but as the barrier that prevents you from ever finding your way to God. The, the very people who speak of Christ, Luther said, are antichrist. The entire, he didn't just mean some people, the entire Christian thing, the whole infrastructure of Christian religion, he uh, um, condemned as antichrist. Well, William, uh, and you find this trend running right through Christian history. Um, William Blake uh, was not a, he was deeply Protestant, and that's why he's part of this series today. He, he channels the spirit of the Protestant Reformation in some particular ways that I'll be talking to you about. Um, uh, here's an example of the way Blake talks about his own faith, the Christian faith. Uh, this is from one of his, uh, this is from one of his, uh, I nearly said poems, but some of his books, you don't even know exactly what they are. Let's say poems. One of his books, he says, as the, caterpill as the caterpillar finds, as the caterpillar chooses the fairest leaves to lay her eggs on, so the priest lays his curse on the fairest of joys. As the caterpillar chooses the nicest leaf, so the priest chooses the nicest joys of human life. And like a caterpillar laying eggs, he kind of secretes his curses <laughs> over them. In another poem by Blake, um, in another poem by Blake, he, um, he talks about going back to the garden of love where he had played as a child. And to his surprise, someone had built a chapel right there in the middle of the garden. And over the doors of the chapel were written the words, Thou shalt not. And there are these priests walking about in black gowns, sort of ruining the atmosphere of this garden where uh, Blake had gone to, uh, to, to play. Uh, the, now again, this is not... One of, I'll just say this by the by, but one of the interesting things about modern atheism is that its criticism of Christianity is quite superficial compared to the way Christians criticize their own religion. It's quite, when you read Richard Dawkins, his, his criticism of Christian morality is, is very superficial compared to the way people like Luther and William Blake and Jesus, uh, the, the, the way from within a religious tradition it can generate its own criticism. Here's, here's the heart of Blake's criticism. It's a protest against morality. In fact, Blake registers his protest against the very idea of morality. Here's how he thinks it works. The Christian religion can easily turn itself in, our Christian communities can easily turn themselves into ways of keeping things under control. So uh, let's say that certain uh, desires are going to be socially dangerous and, and, and destructive, so the Christian faith will help to repress those desires, to provide a, a, a universal moral code to, to keep things safe, to domesticate human desire, to keep things uh, under control. When people begin to respond to this over time, so here's the first problem for Blake. It's turning faith into something primarily negative. Faith is no longer now occupied with the question of how, how can this community help each individual to flourish as much as they could. Instead, it's concerned with the negative question. How do we, how do we help people to restrain desires, to avoid immorality? Um, how do we... How do we help to prevent bad things? Um, the result that this has, Blake, Blake thinks, is that within a Christian society or a Christian community, over time, people become spiritually smaller. You're kind of spiritually rewarded for not breaking the rules, not going outside the predefined boundaries. So over time, the highest values become humility. I adapt myself to what others want from me. And Blake sees humility as a great sin. 
I don't know if there's any uh, people who've read philosophy here, but if you've ever read Nietzsche, there's a kind of, Nietzsche is a, a, a profound atheist critic of Christianity. He also thought that the cultivation of humility is one of the curses that the Christian church has laid upon society. Because instead of, in, instead of being a positive message about the flourishing of the person, it becomes a repressive negative message about how to keep yourself under control, how to make yourself small, safe, docile, domesticated. Um, uh, and, and Blake asks a provocative question in one of his books. Basically, he says, prove to me one place in the stories of Jesus that show that he was humble, in the sense that we understand humility. Uh, as Blake sees Jesus, he's the opposite of humble. He's someone who is always spontaneously being himself, making no concessions to what is expected, what others think is right. Um, Jesus, Blake thinks, is, is animated by a completely different energy than that repressive, negative energy of morality. Um, he, also, he, he would also uh, give you the challenge, Prove one place from the Gospels that shows that Jesus was moral or had any interest at all in morality. Again, when you look at Jesus, what you see is someone living out his life to the utmost with an amazing, courageous disregard for what his society expects of him. It gets him killed, of course. Um, if he was if he was moral, if he matched the standard, if he was humble, then presumably he, he would never be a threat to anybody. Um, so Blake thinks that there is a, a link between turning Christianity into a, a moral code and psychologically actually making people spiritually um, in, enfeebled somehow, making me less fully myself. If you remember, um, uh, now here's, here's an example of, of, uh, of, of, of how this works. Because I do want to say, Blake is not advocating bad behavior. He's not trying to tell you morality's, uh, uh, it's, morality's bad, so you should go and live wicked lives. He, he's not saying that. He's not advocating bad behavior, but he's against the whole tendency to think about Christianity as a moral code. Here's an example. If you've ever been in a relationship with another person, fall in love, so nice. Imagine you sit down, you've, you've, you've just fallen in love, you're getting to know each other, and you sit down together and, and say, look, I've just read this uh, book. I'm doing an ethics class in, in uni. It says that partners are meant to be faithful to one another. So out of respect for that rule, I'm going to try from now on, I'm going to try really hard not to be unfaithful to you. Can you imagine how flattered your, this new love of your life would be to hear that? Um, in fact, to tell them that for the sake of some moral code, you were going to be, not be unfaithful to them would be a supreme insult. It'd be like a slap in the face, right? How does faithfulness work in a relationship? Not, it doesn't work because people are trying to live up to a moral code. When, when there is faithfulness in a relationship, it's almost, the, it's almost accidental. It's the accidental byproduct of something positive, which is what? Love, devotion, all of that. That, that you are positively enamored with somebody, and you don't need a professor of moral philosophy to tell you that you should not be unfaithful to them, right? Um, so the whole... This is kind of how Blake thinks about Christianity. What Christianity has to offer is a positive vision, not a negative set of moral prohibitions. Not that chapel in the garden that says, thou shalt not, but a positive vision about what it means to be a human being, what it means to be alive in God's world. So in the same way, does, does the example make sense? In the same way that it would be a distortion, a, 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 a perverse distortion of love to say that I will be faithful to you for the sake of morality. In, in the, that's, that's kind of um, 
It's love that's the point. It's the positive thing that's the point. Uh, if someone, I'm not trying to, I'm not pretending this is going to fix all your relationship problems, okay? Uh, I don't mean it like that. But just in general terms, uh, the, what's needed in a relationship might be more love. It won't be more morality, a, a more careful study of the moral code if things are going bad. What's going to be needed is something positive, not more negative, repressive mechanisms. Um, like, okay, I'll put on my, what's the thing with, find your friends, I'll put that on my phone so you can monitor my movements and that will help me not to be so unfaithful to you anymore. That's, that's not what's needed. And Blake thinks that's what Christianity easily becomes, this kind of policeman-like mechanism to keep everything under control. And the problem with that is the whole positive vision of life that Jesus has to offer and that the gospel has to offer, it, it kind of withers away. We don't pay any attention to it. We're looking all the time at how we act instead of looking at who we are. Blake, uh, describing the Bible, he says, the whole Bible is filled from end to end with vision and not with moral virtues. Morality, he says, is the stuff of the Greeks and of all warriors. Warriors are people, like soldiers, who, who Blake thinks is like the worst, no offense if you're in the armed um, forces, he thinks to be a warrior is like the worst example of a human being, someone who totally lives by a code, someone whose whole life is guided by rules and requirements and expectations, someone who will always have high ideals to fight for. Um, they're the ones with morality, uh, Blake says. Um, what's in the Bible, though, is vision. Sometimes Blake uses the word imagination, vision. And what he means by that is uh, that what the Bible offers us is a truthful depiction of what this world really is and what our place in this world is. What's gone, what's gone wrong? What's, what's malfunctioned in our lives? Not that we don't know how to live morally, Blake thinks, but that we don't see the world that we're living in. When I look into your face, I don't see you for who and what you really are. When I look at myself, I don't see myself truly as the image of God, as the glory of God in this world. And the whole purpose of Blake's art, I should have shown PowerPoint slides and stuff, by the way. I was too lazy, but I, I could right now be wowing you with amazing brightly colored images of these wonderful nude figures that radiate out divine energy. Blake, Blake tries to depict, uh, he tries to show what it, looks, what it looks like to see the human being through the eyes of Christ, through the eyes of the Bible. Uh, and he, he, his art is completely unique, as you'll know if you've, if, if you've seen any of it. There's nothing else like it. And it's what he describes as vision. It's like a truthful seeing. Uh, it's why in his art, are there any painters here? So maybe this is completely irrelevant to your life. If you're thinking of becoming a painter, I'll just tell you one of his tips about painting. He was, he was deeply opposed to realism in visual art, just trying to depict things realistically. Because if, if just using the naked eye, I, I depict you empirically as you appear to me now, Blake thinks it would be a lie like a kind of almost photographic reproduction of what's in front of me, is not true. The truth about, let's say I'm painting Jesse, right? I do a really realistic thing of Jesse. It's false, though, because what's the truth about Jesse? He's the image of God. He's the glory of God shining out of a human life. That's what's true. So Blake thinks you use art to depict that Jesse as he really is, not just as he appears to my unimaginative, distorted, um, physical eyes. Um, so do you get the idea? Vision. He speaks about the doors of perception, like the, 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 the senses, uh, touch and sight and hearing. And he says, if those doors of perception could be cleansed, we would see everything for what it really is, infinite. We'd see the infinite glory of God alive in the whole creation. One of my favorite Blake uh, quotes is where he says, uh, 
he, uh, he, he's sort of having an imaginary conversation between someone with bad perception, someone who sees only what's right there in front of them and never sees through it to the glory of God. And this person says, when you see the sun rising, don't you see a small disk of fire about the size of a coin? You know, if you look up, it's like coin size. And Blake says, oh, no, no. I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Great contrast, isn't it? One person, very significant that he chooses the coin. One person looks up at God's creation and sees something that reminds them of money. How disgusting, how despicable, what a, what a blasphemy against creation. The ancient people were wiser than us. They used to build temples and make sacrifices and worship the sun. Like they were this far from the truth. Even the Bible depicts it that way. That, that's so nearly true because God's glory is shown there. You just got to make a few minor adjustments and you become a Christian. But the person who looks up in the sky and is reminded of a coin has no hope, <laughs> no soul. Their, their perception is totally false. And when Blake looks at the sun in the sky, he sees the glory of God. He sees the whole company of heaven crying out, holy, holy, holy. The, um, the, so instead of Christianity as morality, what Blake's presenting to us is Christianity as vision. A tr not, not like a fanciful imaginary vision, but a, truth, a truthful vision, a vision of what's really there. And he thinks that is what the Bible has to offer. The, um, in one place, he even says, now you've already admitted that there's no painters here. Are there any musicians or poets, any architects? Well, most of you are in trouble because in one place, Blake says, um, a painter, a poet, a musician, an architect. The man or woman who is not one of these is no Christian. <laughs> He's not really trying to kick you out of Christianity, but do you see the point he's trying to make? The, the, the main business of the Christian life, in Blake's view, is cultivating a truthful vision, the way a poet can actually communicate more truly than the newspaper report about the world. Like they, they, can see, they can see more truly and describe more clearly what's really there. Uh, the way the painter can perceive something that was strangely, my own eyes were strangely blind to until the painter helped me to see. So um, if you're not one of those four, is there any hope for you? No, amen. I'm just joking. <laughs> that's, that's not the end of this sermon. Uh, I'm just joking. Um, uh, you see Blake's point, though. Like, what's the church meant to be? What's the Christian community meant to be? If, if the church, if a Christian community has any valid excuse for existing at all, it would be to be cultivating that truthful vision, to be a place where the doors of perception get cleansed, to be a place where we are learning to see the glory of God shining through every fraction of every atom of creation, and especially the place where we're learning to see the glory of God shining through one another. The, the, a place of transfigured vision. Blake calls it prophetic vision, too, where we're actually seeing this world for what it is. That would be a valid excuse for the church to exist, but not to be a place where we're learning how to behave. Does it mean Christians are going to rush out and behave terribly? I hope not. You can tell me next week what effect this sermon had on you. Uh, uh, no, it, it doesn't mean that because, again, just like faithfulness will be the accidental byproduct of a loving infatuation with another person. It's not a perfect analogy, right? Just imagine like that first month of total infatuation where unfaithfulness would actually be, it'd be like biologically impossible because this other person is flooding your brain with chemicals so much. You're so infatuated with them. That's, that's, 
That's his picture of how morality would work, an accidental byproduct of an enraptured vision of the glory of God shining through this world. So, there's a bit about William Blake. I think that the, I haven't fully explained how Protestant this is, but the, the critique of morality, the critique of um, the Christian community as predominantly a, a community that polices moral standards is a deep, deeply embedded part of the Protestant tradition. Again, as I, said, as I said in the first week of this series, all protest is just the negative side of something positive. It's not because Blake is against good behavior. It's because he's got something much more important and positive that he's trying to say, and that is uh, the Christian faith as a, um, as a truthful seeing, as a visionary community rather than a moralistic and legal community. So maybe... When we think today about morality, about ethics, maybe for us, I'm going to end with this, maybe for us, the right question to ask is not, what should I do, but who should I be? In fact, from God's point of view, who am I? That's the right question to be asking, to be learning to see myself, not to be preoccupied with how will I monitor my behavior? What's the right and the wrong choice to make in this situation? Do you remember those WWJD bracelets that were going around? At, uh, now, no offense if anyone's wearing one tonight, but maybe for me, the right question to ask would not be what would Jesus do? As if I'm trying to treat Jesus like an ethics textbook. How do I apply Jesus to my life? Do you see how from Blake's point of view, that's almost a blasphemy against Jesus, to treat him like he is a moral code that I'm going to imply, instead of treating him as a revelation of God and of humanity, uh, someone who opens my eyes to see the truth about the whole wide world and my place in it. So maybe the question to ask is not, what would Jesus do? But what would, for me, what would a fully alive Ben do? And who would that fully alive Ben be? And how can I, once I see a vision of that, how can I somehow adapt my life to that vision? Not, after all, Jesus doesn't come to, he doesn't come to lay down a, a, a new moral code and to create a new community that are going to have all the right answers to complicated ethical problems. Jesus doesn't write any book. He doesn't seem too worried about... When people ask him serious moral problems, he, he likes to sort of throw a paradox back at them rather than just answering the question. Um, Jesus comes uh, not to... I nearly lost that train of thought. You get the idea. Okay. Um, I'm going so long that I'm actually boring myself now, and I've lost the train of thought. Uh, but, uh, so Jesus comes not to create a moral community. He comes as a kind of prototype of a new humanity. Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus is, he is that human being who is fully alive. He is, therefore, the glory of God walking around in a pair of sandals on this world. That's who Jesus is. And by looking at him, I'm not able to derive little lessons for my life. I'm able to see a prototype of who I am and what I am called to be. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. Amen.